Hello everybody and welcome back to Case Law where today we're going to be looking at what can happen if you intervene in a fight and find yourself on the wrong side. And what I mean by that is where you see an altercation taking place and you step in, perhaps believing somebody is being attacked, only later to find out that you've attacked somebody who was trying to do the right thing. An example of this would be say, if a thief snatched an old lady's handbag, gets stopped by a passerby, and then you stop the passerby, effectively allowing the thief to go free. In particular, we're going to be looking at the case of William Gladstone, a slightly older case, but it's a case that deals with this situation very well and stands today as good law on the topic of self-defense in these circumstances. Before getting into what happened though, I'd just like to say that I'm trying a new walk and talk style of video today that's kind of inspired by what normally happens happens when I go on walks with people. For some reason, going on a nice walk always leads people to ask to hear stories about cases, and I have spent many walks basically doing what I'm doing in these videos, which is telling stories. So I hope you enjoy, and perhaps let me know what you think in the comments. Okay, so moving on to the case of William. The court actually acknowledges at the outset of its judgment that this is a fairly unusual case and isn't one you see often. One day, the victim in this case, a man referred to as Mason in the judgment of the court, saw a youth grab a handbag off a woman who was out and about shopping. So we're talking about robbery of a woman here. Think young lad, probably in a face covering, doing a grab and run. Mason did something that is actually surprisingly rare in these circumstances though. He ran to catch up with the robber, grabbed hold of him with a few to taking him to a nearby police station. A classic Good Samaritan act really. However, the youth broke free from Mason's grip and ran away again. Mason chased the youth again and caught him, but this time he twisted the young lad's arm behind his back to stop him from moving. I'm not that sure what the manoeuvre's called, but I think you know the one that I'm talking about. Maybe the, I think the police call it a rear wrist lock, and it's one of those grips where as soon as you're in it, there's no getting out without pretty much breaking your arm. Mason again said he did this with a view to taking the youth to the police station. This is where the situation gets interesting though, as the robber actually started to call out for help. And up walks our defendant in this case, Mr. Gladstone Williams, sees a young guy being restrained by Mason and goes up to Mason to check out what's happening. According to Mason, he told Gladstone that he was detaining this guy for mugging an old lady, and in a move that I think probably put the whole situation into overdrive, he told Gladstone that he was a police officer, even though he wasn't. Gladstone then asked Mason for proof that he was a police officer, which obviously Mason didn't have, and when it became clear that Mason wasn't a police officer, a punch-up ensued, such that Mason came out worse for wear. I'm not sure how long it lasted, but Mason's injuries were broken teeth, bruising and marks to his face, bleeding lips and gums, you know, what I guess you might expect from a proper bust-up. After the fight, the real police got involved and Gladstone found himself charged with assault occasioning actual bodily harm pursuant to section 46 of the Offences Against the Person Act. Now, at this stage of the video, I would say perhaps pause and have a think about what you think the outcome of the case should be. Should Gladstone actually be convicted of assault? If not, why not? I mean, in this situation, an innocent guy was trying to stop a woman from being robbed and basically almost got his teeth knocked out. Well, to start with, I will say that Gladstone was convicted of assault at trial and given a conditional discharge for 12 months and some financial penalties. A conditional discharge is basically where the court says it won't sentence you for the crime, but if you get into trouble again during the 12 months discharge period, you will be sentenced both for the new crime and for the old crime. However, this conviction was quashed by the Court of Appeal on a point of law, which means that Gladstone's conviction was basically thrown out and he suffered no penalty. In doing this, the court considered the application of what you probably know of as self-defense, which is often used as a catch-all term for situations where you can legally use force against another person in a way that would normally be criminal. One such situation is defense of yourself, obviously, but so too is defense of another person and the use of force to prevent a crime being committed. So we can see here that Gladstone is actually using force both to defend the youth who committed the robbery and also to prevent him from being assaulted by Mason, which would be a crime. 
But what you're probably thinking about the whole misunderstanding, wasn't it actually Mason who was using force in defence of another and to prevent a crime? I mean, the guy being detained was running off with somebody's handbag. Well, yes it was, and here lies the crux of this case. You see, when a jury is looking at self-defence, they have to take the facts as the defendant genuinely believed them to be, and this covers mistaken beliefs, such as the one in this case, as long as the belief is genuinely held. The jury and the victim all accepted that Gladstone was genuinely mistaken about what was going on, and let's be honest, this confusion was added to by the fact that Mason said he was a copper and he wasn't, and on that basis his use of force was judged against the situation as he saw it. Let me know in the comments what you thought about the case, and let me know if you can see any holes in this approach of looking at what defendants genuinely believe. Also, standard disclaimer, but this is obviously not proper legal advice, not least because I don't even know where you're watching this video from. Thank you very much for watching, and I'll catch you next time.